Hello and welcome to this Edexcel A-Level Geography Inquiry Question Review. Uh, today we're looking at Tectonics Inquiry Question 1. Why are some locations more at risk from tectonic hazards? Now as this is the first in the series and it's important to recognise that through all of these videos we will start off by looking at the specification. The specification is so important to look back on on a regular basis when you're making your notes, when you're having your lessons, and then when you're reviewing and revising and planning your exam practice. This is because these specifications contain all of the keywords that you are likely to come across in the exam. Also, they are the keywords that you will need to understand and be able to use in the answers. Now, whether this would be explain questions or assess and evaluate questions. Now, it's important to remember that when you're looking at explain questions, it will often relate to just one of the sections within each of the detailed comments. It may be that it gives you a key idea and you're expected to bring in one or two of these, but generally explain questions will be related to just one key idea. For assess and evaluate questions, it is more likely that you would be expected to look at different contents from different key ideas and link those together because that is where you're showing the application of your knowledge and understanding. And it is also where you will be need to looking out for the case studies, particularly the compulsory case studies, and include those in your answers as a way of explanation and as a way of being able to put assessment and evaluation into your answer. So if we look at the key information that we'll be looking at. For inquiry question one, we're going to be looking at the areas of where the uh, hazards are found and the reasons why they are found there. We'll look at the theory behind how we found this out and then we'll look at some of the actual hazards that we find at these different locations. So first of all, looking towards some of the uh, theory behind the location of them. And it's important to realize there are four main types of plate boundary that we understand. We have the divergent, the plates moving apart, the convergent, plates moving together. We have the collision or divergent collision, where again, the plates move together. And we have the conservative, where they're sliding past each other. Um, either at different speeds in a similar direction or in different directions. Now, for me, I found that drawing these diagrams are such an easy way of to showing this using this dual coding technique. So what we can have is all of the key information about each of the different plate types. So if we start off with the divergent uh, or constructive plate boundaries, here we tend to have two oceanic plates, yeah, and these are moving apart. And it's now believed that this is due to slab pull. The weight of one end of the um, plate being pulled by gravity into the Earth's mantle. And this is leading to these plates falling, uh, moving apart. Now, obviously, there are convection currents as part of this theory as well. But now with the exam board and with current educational thinking, slab pull is seen to be a major part of the movement of this. So what do we get at divergent or constructive margins? Well, the magma tends to be basaltic in that it has a lower viscosity and a lower silica and gas content. For the volcanic explosivity index, these tend to be lower, but the Volcanic eruptions may tend to be of a longer duration. So we tend to find this much runnier um, lava um, leading to shield like volcanoes, so much flatter volcanoes, but these can link uh, look at much longer eruption periods. When we look at the earthquakes, we can find that these are often quite small because there is not the friction and the pressure building up as the plates are rubbing together. As we look at the convergent or destructive plate boundaries, here we have the other end of the oceanic plate. Slab pull is forcing the subduction of 
the oceanic plate which is denser and heavier underneath the continental plate yeah now here we start to have the friction and the pressure building up particularly in the benioff zone now it may be that as the continental plate it's struggling to move forward we start to see the fold mountain so the mountain ranges of the andes and of the rockies in the americas now what happens is as the oceanic plate is pulled down by slab pull into the subduction zone the heat and the pressure and the friction from the movement and the heat in the mantle starts to melt the end of the oceanic plate now because of this and with all the material in there this can lead to much more andesitic type of lava this tends to be more viscous and more silica content in it therefore the volcanic explosivity is much larger but the eruptions tend to be much less frequent with regards to earthquakes we do tend to find that these tend to have a larger um, recording on the moment magnitude scale and obviously these are often seen with larger occurrences of tsunamis as well we then have the convergent collision plate margins now this is where two continental plates tend to bash together such as the indian subcontinent and the eurasian plate forming the fold mountains such as the himalayas or the alps now here there tends to be very little magma yeah because the two plates are pushing and going up rather than being subducted so therefore there are very small chance of volcanic eruptions but the earthquakes tend to be very large and very powerful and very difficult to predict at the conservative or transform plate boundaries we could have oceanic or continental plates and as they move sort of alongside each other but at different speeds they cause these fault lines such as the san andreas fault in california and these can lead to large earthquakes now it's also important to understand the formation of volcanoes around hot spots this is where mantle plumes underneath the uh, crust of the earth forming large uh, magma chambers which can be forming and as the plates move over them we can get these chains of volcanic islands such as hawaii there are also intraplate earthquakes now this might be because of old fault lines which have now um, moved away because they're no longer on the plate boundaries or it could be due to underlying geology or old cave or, or ma old mine systems so intraplate tends to be those earthquakes which are found quite a distance from the plate boundaries so how did we come to find this out well it all started really with the evidence found by Wagner and he started to notice this theory of continental drift the way that continents were linked together in the past forming the great continent of Pangaea and he did this by looking at fossil evidence looking at why there were similar plants and animals in different continents several thousand miles away but also by looking at glacial evidence and the movement of glaciers um, looking at things like Rouge Moutonnais looking at the erosional processes of glacial valleys and was able to notice that the continents were lined up very very differently to how they were in the past now moving on um, later into the 20th century people started to notice paleomagnetism the way that the rocks were lined in magnetic strips and as the earth's magnetic core flips over a long period of time then we're noticing there were these flips in the rocks so this would um, suggest that the divergent plate boundaries were creating a new rock and the iron content in that was reflecting in the pole polarity of the earth's magnetic field at the time then as we moved on into second world war we started to look at the seafloor mapping um, and then beyond that we started to look at geographical information systems look at satellite mapping which have all backed up this idea of continental drift and the theory from beyond that now originally it was pretty much thought that convection currents um, caused by the heat in the earth's core and the molten magma 
were leading to the plates sat above the magma being forced in different directions. But now it is much, it is thought that the gravity is leading to the slab pull, which is causing the subduction of one end of the plate and then leading to sea floor spreading, which again is backed up by the evidence of paleomagnetism. So there's the background theory behind it. So looking at what are the main hazards? Well, with earthquakes, we've got the different types of waves. We've got the primary and secondary waves. These tend to um, move within the Earth's surface up from the epicenter. These are the types of waves that can be noticed much earlier on and can give maybe a few minutes warning um, before the love waves hit, because these are the slowest moving, but these are the uh, waves which move along the surface. And these are the ones that cause most damage. So they're the primary hazards. This can obviously lead to ground shaking and to the crustal fracturing, which can lead to the aftershocks and future earthquakes. But there are also secondary hazards such as liquefaction. The moving of the land can force the water or air gaps in the rock out, causing the subsidence of land. It can also cause landslides on much steeper areas of land as well, particularly in the mountain areas. And then it is also known that earthquakes can lead to the secondary hazards of tsunami where they form under oceans. With volcanoes, the main primary hazards are the idea of lava, which everybody knows about, but is actually probably the least damaging. It's often the most predictable hazard and it's relatively slow flowing, so easier to get away from and control. So although it might lead to damage of property, it's less likely to lead to damage of uh, human life. Then there are pyroclastic flows. These are the big expansive clouds of fast moving hot rock and ash, um, which move at such rapid speed and really are one of the key reasons for major deaths. We then have the ash falls from Ayafiletiokul, um, which is the best example of this, which can cover crops, it can kill um, animals and plants and lead to longer term issues. And then we can have the escape of gas such as Naira Gongo, which led to uh, carbon dioxide, uh, carbon monoxide falling down the hillside, killing whole villages. Then the ash, if mixes with large amounts of water from glacial melt or from heavy rainfall, can lead to lahars. And Jokulflab, which are often found in Iceland, uh, which are caused by the melting of glaciers on top of the volcanoes, leading to large scale flooding. Then we have tsunamis, um, and this is where there can be earthquakes, landslides or volcanic eruptions, which lead to a large water column displacement. As this water is forced upwards, it then starts to travel outwards, leading to waves which have a great wavelength, often of several hundred miles, but with a very low amplitude, but traveling at a rapid speed around 500 kilometers an hour at times. Now these aren't a problem in deep ocean, they only become a major problem when the wave begins to shoal in shallow water because the front of the wave starts to slow down, the back of the wave catches up, increases the height or the amplitude of the wave and this is what makes it possible for the waves to travel so far inland. But these, using things like time travel maps, if you know when the earthquake occurs, you could predict the arrival of the tsunami on different coasts to provide some form of warning if there is a warning system in place. So there we have the background to the location of the different types of plates and the different types of hazards that can be found there. I hope you found this useful. I hope it's been good for you and hopefully see you again. Many thanks. Bye.